Welcome to Advancing Accessibility, a mini podcast series focusing on the great work done by individuals pushing for accessibility in the gaming industry and answering the question, what's next? This show is brought to you by Players Research's Advancing Accessibility. To find out more about what Player Research and this initiative, you can be able to go to the link in the show notes or to playerresearch.com. I'm Steve Saylor, host for the show, an accessibility consultant, content creator, and Twitch ambassador, uh, as well as host of this series. Today's episode is all about PR marketing and accessibility. My guest today is Jessica Roach, the Senior Corporate and Accessibility Communications Manager at Ubisoft. Talk about a a mouthful right there. Uh, And also just a great human being and friend. Hi, Jessica. How are you today? Hi, I'm great. And thank you so much for having me, Steve. Of course. So, you know what, I, as I do with uh, all these shows, is I want to be able to kind of get to know uh, you a little bit and you know, let the audience get to know you a little bit. So why don't you tell us like a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So like you said, I'm a senior corporate communications manager at Ubisoft. Um, but on a more personal level, I'm from North Carolina. Um, I moved to the Bay Area after college and I've been here um, about a decade. So I've been working um Started out on the agency side, working for 2K's PR agency, and then moved over in-house to Ubisoft, um, and that's where I met our accessibility team and started this work. Very cool. I will say that if you ever need recommendations of where to be able to go in San Francisco, Jessica's definitely the right person to be able to talk to. You showed me some great spots. In the, uh, it was in the mission, essentially, was where we were. The- yeah, we were at El Tacho, a really beautiful rooftop bar with a sometimes view, depending on the clouds. Um, the sure. Fog. But um, yeah. It was I, great. I got a list. <laughs> yeah, I love that wine bar that we went to. That had like that was like a like a uh, that had like a whole bunch of plants and stuff in it too. Yeah, like, plant that, store slash wine bar. That was yeah, good. that was great. I love that. So anyway, yeah, Jessica's great recommendation for that. So. What was it that kind of got you interested in gaming? Was that something that, uh, you know, you picked up as a kid or was it something as, as you, as you got older? Like what, what was, what interest you about gaming and like, what were some of your favorite games, uh, like during that, uh, when you discovered it? So I actually got into gaming through work, um, which I think is a different story than a lot of people in this industry. So, um, it was you know, at my agency, I was sort of assigned to the 2K account, um, and I had other accounts as well, other tech clients, um, but I really loved gaming. And I think, um, you know, I, I think just going to E3, going to some of these different events and just capturing like the energy, enthusiasm and excitement that this community had for gaming um, made me realize, like, I don't know, I can I can talk about uh, different tech products, but gaming is this really exciting community. So kind of from there, I wanted to deepen my knowledge of how to do games PR. And so I started playing games, um, yeah, in my 20s. So it was something where I definitely had some friends kind of like walk me through some of the, um, the things that I think people just know growing up playing games. You figured out um, that some of the uh, um, first person shooters I'd play, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I just kind of like, jumped in and and um i think my uh favorite well, my favorite ubisoft game is immortals phoenix rising so mm. it's, that's like the only I, i'm not a game finisher um that's the only <laughs> game i really like play start to finish oh cool um but yeah also getting into some indies like spirit fair um you know starting and playing on the switch so it it's it's been great to kind of see the passion for gaming kind of first through the community and then from a personal level I love that. And actually, you know, that's something that we haven't really uh, discussed in like in the accessibility community, even uh, about sort of like when you jump into games like later on in life, like a lot of us sort of so we try to be able to play them like as we're kids, but, you know, we can't. So it wasn't until much later we can be able to jump into it. But for you, as you're kind of like you got into it in your in your 20s, what were some of the, like the the challenges or some of the fun stuff that you kind of discovered as you were jumping into games for the first time? Yeah, I'm laughing because um, the first game I wanted to play was Bioshock Infinite. Like I said, I was working ah. for 2K, so I did work on the um, uh, with Irrational a bit. Um, so <laughs> I was playing with my friend, and I'm just you know running around, I'm shooting, I'm like whatever, and he's looking in all of the cabinets, uh, you know, for for different help and different items. And I just it didn't occur to me that I could go over to a corner and like look around and gather you know different. Uh, items to enhance my gameplay so it was just kind of going through without any sort of leveling up um just not really knowing that oh if i explore uh, and look in different things i can um 
uh, you know, find all, find all these goodies. Oh, so, uh, I... that was something to me. Like, I just it wasn't spelled out for me. And I think as a gamer, you know, to go look in the drawer. Um, but I didn't, so I had to be taught. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's honestly great because it's like we you know we we talk about um, often t- like we sort of take it for granted essentially that you know any game that comes out, it's like there's sort of an inherent language that people learn when when like as you know for over decades essentially of of playing video games, but um, it's very uh, it's not necessarily rare, but it's definitely like with something that we should that we with like just in the gaming community should touch on more is. Yeah, what about you know those uh, those folks that essentially are jumping into a genre for the first time or jumping into gaming for the first time? Um, from your perspective, um, it for like the like we, we sometimes like I don't know if we, they call it uh, a, a, what they call this at Ubisoft, but uh, we're in some of the places I've worked. They call this the the, the fatui or the first time user experience. What are some of the things that you wish games would do more in that first time user experience? Uh, at like so to kind of help you know players either again jump into a new genre or just you know jumping into gaming period yeah i think i mean i i guess i kind of call it the tutorial menu i think games have gotten better at it in the decade that i started playing so i think about some older games you just kind of boot up and start playing um but I really appreciate, and I think the most recent game I've played was Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, and just mm-hmm. kind of walking me through what to do, that kind of um, starting out in, in um, you know, more of a guided guided sense. Um, and, I, and I think, too, I mean, personally, I do a lot of Googling as I play games, so um, it's, I'm not really answering the question. I think it's That's a good okay. question, but I, I think that in, um, in general, games have just gotten better at making it feel more... Uh, open to new players from the beginning okay so when like using prince of uh, persia as kind of an example what, like because that game is you know it like you're right it definitely does have a pretty good onboarding experience for learning the mechanics and everything with uh, within the game but it also is known for uh it's sort of uh, a steep combat curve uh, as it were being able to learn all the different moves and it can be challenging and especially when you're kind of going up into uh, against like certain bosses um what was some of the challenge like uh, like did, what were some of the challenges or even like was there any like accessibility that uh that, that within the game that helped you be able to play that and, or did you find like yep yeah, no this is it's a little little too advanced complex for me like I, I, this is just I'll, I'll i'll maybe come back to it at a certain point or or whichever yeah i did get to the point where i felt like i had had a good time in the game but i didn't want to continue um it pushing through uh, for me so i i was able to explore um a good amount but i think um yeah the eye of the wanderer the um I'm trying to think what else uh what it's called the portals that yes. open oh um, my goodness yes skip, yeah i can't think of the feature name right now off the top of my head but okay. um, yeah definitely the port the portals where you can skip some of the more difficult platforming was really helpful and helping me get through and see more of the story Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm not really a game completionist, so I Mm -hmm. think it it really depends on the type of game, but I think Prince of Persia, the Lost Crown was the type of game that I could actually take a stab at and see if I liked it and if I wanted to stick with it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it opened it up for me. Okay, cool. And you actually said something that, uh, that even sparked a little bit. Another question in my head was, because you mentioned about you got the... The, the you got the fun that you needed out of it without necessarily completing the game and and you know as also someone who is a, a chronic not you know not completionist in a game uh there's like very rare where i can actually be able to roll credits on any game um where do you find that for yourself like what what are the things you kind of are like when you kind of get when you look back on certain gaming experiences being like okay you know what i got the fun out of it like uh, this is it. This is it for me. Like, what, like, because some folks, you know, they feel guilty about not finishing a game, or they got so many games that are just, you know, on their backlog that don't they don't finish. And and I will feel guilty sometimes about that. But when you like, what are what are some of the things that you look for when you're like enjoying a game, or that a game is fun for you? And then you know, if you can't finish a game, it's like, okay, you know what, I I got this kind of experience while playing that I enjoyed the most. Like where where is some of the things that you're looking for when you're when you're playing a game like that? Yeah, I really like narrative based games. So I think just getting lost in the story. So on the flip side, I I am kind of a completionist when it comes to books. So I think that ah, okay, correlates okay. 
So, you know, I like to see that story. Um, I don't feel the same way with movies. Um, so I don't know what that, is, what that says about me, but I do think that I kind of enjoy that compelling narrative. Um, and again, Spirit Fair, I thought was a great game that kind of kept, kept me moving with the gameplay. You know, it wasn't that difficult of gameplay, but it did have this story that kind of helped me, you know, want to keep uh, moving forward. Um, what Remains of Edith Finch, that's another, another good one. Sure. So, okay. yeah, I think it's narrative for me, but also the visuals. I think if I like the art style, I'm more likely to keep going. Yeah, that's generally two things I also look at as well. Like, I'm I'm definitely very much a story guy. Like, uh, I, I'm sort of, the, again, the, the opposite of you. It's like, I can enjoy, like, and finish movies and, and, and sometimes TV shows, but books I have, I have trouble trying to be able to complete, as, like, as well. I think it's more of... It, it takes away like where I'm watching a movie or or or, or TV show essentially like I, or even technically I guess even playing a game is that you know that that experience is catered for me because it's it's what the creators had wanted it but where I find that. And, and I think, like, I think probably maybe uh, for you is that for books is that you're, you know, you create the story in your head, like you're, you're, it's that imagination. So you're more invested in it because it's what you created of it. Uh, and I guess gaming is in, in a sense, like there is that kind of connection between the developer, like uh, the creator and the gamer or the player, essentially that, you know, there's that the player can create their own experiences, but then also the creator can create their experiences too. So, um, but Hey, like, like, you know, as we said, like, Playing games for fun, it's okay to be able to not finish games. It's it's fine. You're okay. It's great. <laughs> yeah, um, no one's keeping track, you know? Like, no yeah. one but me. <laughs> it's totally exactly, okay. yeah. You it's know, about th- having fun. <laughs> exactly. There should be, like, an achievement to be able to unlock being like, okay, I've unlocked the fun. It's good. We're good. And then that's it. <laughs> you yeah. just stop the game. Absolutely. And sometimes it just depends on time of life. Like, I don't play games as much in the summer because the days are longer and I'm doing things outdoors. I play games a lot more in the winter. It's dark. So <laughs> it really depends on when the game launches and when I get my hands on it, too. I definitely understand that for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so shifting gears just a tiny bit, I, I wanted to kind of ask you, um, what kind of got you interested in the accessibility side, because you said you mentioned you you, you worked at uh, you know some pr- uh, previous places before, obviously uh, Ubisoft, and and uh, and then sort of helping to spearhead a lot of the Ubisoft PR initiatives uh, for accessibility. But I wanted to know, yeah, get to know like what is what would sort of got you interested in accessibility, kind of uh, initially. Yeah, so my initial introduction to accessibility was through David Tisseran, our um, current director of accessibility. I know you know him. Um, Probably everyone listening to this podcast is familiar with who he is, but um, if not, he's um, a really wonderful human and someone who's just very passionate about their work. Um, And so it had kind of come my way because he had an interview request come in. So um, we work with speakers to help them prepare for any type of interview podcast um, speaking opportunity. Um, So I was kind of assigned, oh yeah, I'll take this one. So it just started with a simple part of my job. Um, But I think what where it really took off is realizing that David was doing really great work. Um, there was a really cool story to tell, and there wasn't really anybody on my team that was sort of had the the bandwidth and the assignment to kind of let's build this out, let's talk about it. So I happened to have the time and think it was worth pursuing. And so um, I went to Montreal for something else, and I met up with David. Um, and I, I, I told the story at a GA conf, but it was funny because, um, you know, I think David kind of had the impression of like the PR police was coming in, um, you know, maybe going to tell him what he can and can't do. And it was really more of a meeting of me wanting to know, like, what all are you doing and how can PR support that? Like, how can we improve some of the, um, and I guess on a specific example, it's that he was communicating a lot on his Twitter um, and so that's something that, you know, like, can we, can we do a blog post about this instead? Can we kind of wrap that in? Can we pitch it to press? Like, what can we do in a more structured and kind of, you know, communications lovers sense? Um, how can we amplify and support this work? So needless to say, it was a great meeting. Um, it kind of went from there, just learning what his team was working on um, and then how we could support that through communications. I love that. And and kind of um, like to kind of give a bit of context for those who are uh, listening that may not know, Ubisoft has really been kind of at the forefront of something that I like I and other you know advocates have been kind of pushing for um, within the industry is just more information about accessibility in, in the games that, they, that, that are coming out. And it, it just is like it's consistent. It's been consistently uh, or yeah, it's been consistent 
pretty much since um around about basically around like 20 just before 20 like the pandemic in 2020 like around like 2018 is when kind of i sort of really kind of discovered a lot of it was just because i was willing to be able to talk about accessibility even though it may not have everything that we that disabled players might need or want it was just being able to have that information available uh and before a game was like had launched was something that we hadn't we hadn't really seen before and also in a sense we actually have not really seen a lot of that uh since but uh, as the years have gone by ubisoft has really been you know uh been pushing that at the forefront and, and keep adding more like with uh obviously with uh, obviously with the ubisoft news team and, and creating like regular content uh, on that side but including accessibility as part of it but also uh, for great example, last year, I was actually like uh, at the great opportunity to be able to be at Summer Game Fest live um, when they announced Prince of Persia Lost Crown. And my Discord, uh, which is a full of uh, accessibility uh, accessibility people, was blowing up because they were like, oh, Ubisoft also announced the accessibility in this game, too. And I was like, oh, like literally it was instantly when, once the trailer kind of went live. And normally we haven't really seen a lot of that. Um, so I'm very uh, excited to be able to talk to you today to kind of go through the, basically like the nitty gritty of, of how that sort of came to be and what are some of the, uh, the things that you're, that you're doing uh, over at Ubisoft and, and kind of helping to spearhead uh, over there. So let's kind of start off with, because um, you said you had that conversation with, with David uh, and you wanted to be able to kind of uh, learn more how to be able to support uh, the, his, his team and, and the accessibility being done at Ubisoft. What were some of like the, uh, the sort of the takeaways that you had with, with working with David uh, at the beginning? And then you were like, OK, what can we be able to do within our current uh, sort of PR marketing uh, sort of setup and procedure to kind of in, not, like to figure out ways to integrate accessibility uh, into that? Yeah, so I think the first, um, one of the most important things to David was really building everything that he did based on the feedback from the community. So that's something we 100% wanted to take notes from is that we're not just doing this for, you know, to look good or whatever. Like we are doing this to meet specific needs that specific people in the community are asking about. So um, making sure to amplify and elevate their voices. So that was kind of leads into why we did um, in the, the blog post you're referring to with Ubisoft News, we call them accessibility spotlights. So, you know, that's something that um, it really was in response to pe what people from the community, including yourself, were asking for. We want the information before the game's out so we can know whether or not we can buy it, whether or not we can participate in all of the kind of hype leading up to the game well, is it going to be accessible for me? Um, so that was really the need that we set out to meet. Um, and you're right, 2020, we started um, doing kind of a blog post for Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Immortals Phoenix Rising, and Watch Dogs Legion. Um, so we were kind of figuring out the format then. We were working with each team, like, hey, what's in the game? How can we talk about it? Um, but after that, we really decided to, okay, we know what we need to say. Let's make a standard format let's call it something specific so that when we can go to a team, we're going to talk about, let's do your accessibility spotlight, not just, hey, let's put together a blog post containing all of the information about accessibility in your game, and we'll do an interview, and we'll have a list. Like, we have a brand, we have kind of a standard um, format, and I think, um, you know, we have kickoff calls with the team, so just really creating something um, based on a need from the community standardizing the process and then trying to get those out uh, before launch. Okay. So when you're talking to uh, the developers or the, or the studio or the team that's, uh, that's working, uh, so they're already able to kind of gather um, that accessibility information. What are some of the, like, uh, I don't want to say challenges in, in a sense, but because uh, like, I know it's oftentimes whenever like, uh, like developers may not know sort of what, uh, what they can't like, what they're, able to talk about or you know features that essentially are still being worked on but not sure whether it's going to end up in the final game like how do you like how do you sort of approach a developer and be like okay let, let's let like you know let's fo like have a good focus and a highlight uh, uh like of what you're the, the great stuff that you're doing there like wh what are that kind of what are those conversations like when you're uh, when you're talking to them so i think a lot of it is about you know education so starting with like what's the need like why are we doing this like this is yes we're the pr team but we're not doing this necessarily as a marketing beat we're doing this in order to provide crucial information to a group of people that need it so just kind of setting um setting the stage for here's our goals 
Um, but we also really rely on the dev team. Like we don't want to push them to share information before they're ready. And to your point, if we don't know if the game's going to have something or not, if we put something out before we know, it's a little premature, right? So mm-hmm. we don't want to <clears throat> say it and then have to cut it or not say something that's actually, you know, really going to be great for the community. So it's kind of a, an ongoing conversation. I think our best um, point of success is just getting in front of the dev teams and saying, here's what we want to do. So we're aligned on the direction, but the timing, it really does depend on the dynamics of that game, of the studio, the team, the individual. Like there's so many different factors that go into determining the timing. Um, what we have said over the last couple of years is we want one month before launch. So that's kind of our as a minimum, and we don't always hit it. Sometimes it's a few days for different reasons. Um, but I will say over the past, I think the past year or so, we've we've gotten them all out at least right before launch, if not a good amount of time before launch. Um, but that's something that's kind of our hard like line in the sand. We're like, it's got to be out before launch. We want people to know whether or not they can buy the game before they're at that point of purchase. So um, that's something too. We've had a lot of teams come alongside us and definitely be on board with, okay, we want to do this. It's more about the logistics of figuring out when and what do we say and, you know, when is this feature going to be confirmed? When you have like an announcement like that, where you know you're going to like, uh, that's going to be something that is going to be talked about either whether it's for around the announcement of a game or it's like, yeah, got a feature that uh, essentially that you want to be able to highlight uh, for accessibility. When do you usually talk to the development team about that, that, about that? You said like, you know, some features are kind of built into design, but um, like when you're usually talking to them uh, before that, uh, that article gets, uh, gets made. And then what are the sort of the procedures that you would go through to, okay, like we got this feature, like we talking to the devs, like, well, well, and then writing it all up. So what are sort of that, that kind of workflow uh, to kind of uh, be able to build, uh, build that out for uh, up until launch? Yeah, it timing depends, but we've talked to teams, you know, up to a year before their launch. Um, and it's really just, like I said, about getting it on their radar. <laughs> so um, having a lot of times we have a kickoff call. Sometimes if we work with a team in the past, we'll just do a kickoff email like, hey, it's time for your spotlight. Um, and that's actually been something that's great. Like over the past four years that we've been building this program, we were initially doing a lot of explaining of here's what accessibility is. Here's why it's important. And now we're kind of summarizing that a little bit more like, hey, accessibility is important. Here's why. And they're like, I know what's next. So that's been really, really great to kind of accompany a lot of our our colleagues on that journey. Um, So we have a kickoff call um, and then we kind of ask them, you know, what are we thinking? We're going to have a lot, a lot to offer. Has the game been designed with accessibility in mind? Is it going to, you know, be something that we know a little bit closer to launch? Um, just getting a sense of where that game is and what the team wants to focus on. Um, and then we find the right person. So who's the person going to be doing the Q&A? So who's the person maybe leading it? And it's interesting, too, because it can be a variety of different job functions. So it can mm-hmm. be a UX director. It can be a game director. Um, it can be someone on the QA accessibility team or QC. Um, so it really depends. So it's kind of identifying, you know, who's the person that, is going to have the the time or interest or passion in helping us pull this together and telling that complete story. Sometimes it's more of a team effort and we have different speakers contributing on the different things that they worked on. So um, it's definitely a fluid process and it depends on what that team, their kind of dynamics and what they want to talk about. And then our role is to really kind of bring that together, uh, work with the Ubisoft News team. And then we do have like a standard format for the list of accessibility features and we always like run that by the accessibility team because sometimes they will also have additional insight on you know hey also this feature that you don't think is for accessibility should be included because it can help in this way so they're kind of adding their expertise um, and we bring it all together then we work with the social team the ubisoft news team um, yeah and just like any other kind of comms plus point we agree on the right timing um, send it out I love that. And uh, what, 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 like, when, like, what was sort of went into the decision of trying to be able to make, like, make sure that a lot of that, uh, like, for instance, like, yeah, again, use an example, Prince of Persia with that article coming out of accessibility spotlight at, like, literally at announce uh, time. 
what was like uh, uh what was like went into the decision to try to be able to make sure that that goes out re- like at the same time because ubisoft has been very good at that like no matter what announcement is made whatever trailer comes out there's always some sort of accessibility information um or just even like uh, uh i definitely want to talk about sort of like maybe like the accessibility like trail like accessible trailers yeah. and stuff like that too um what are some like what are some of the processes to be able to to be able to put that in, into place that so that you know these things are like already like at this like and are given the same essentially the same weight as any other sort of marketing beat um when you're marketing the game yeah so that um I think for that, I will tell you more about the comms team, at Ubisoft. So mm. I'm on the corporate comms team. Um, and then we, we're an army. We're a really big comms team. Um, and so over the years, what the corporate team, my, myself and my colleagues have been doing is updating um, the larger comms team on here's accessibility best practices. So they've really followed us through this whole journey. So um, I also want to give credit my colleague Holly. She actually was working on accessibility and reaching out to the creators in that space even before I joined Ubisoft. So I kind of picked up the work we were doing from her. Um, and so just having those allies on the comms team. So, for example, you know, Holly will be in charge of making you know the whole life cycle of um, promoting a certain a certain game. So. When I partner with Holly, every game that she works on, um, she's thinking about accessibility. So she's done multiple spotlights across different teams. Um, so I think just having that continuity too of having more and more people understand the goals. We're not introducing the concept to people every time. We're partnering with them and then they're kind of building on. They're like, oh, actually I saw something in this email we sent out, but there wasn't alt text on this image. So they're coming to us with ideas as well. So. It's been a lot of just education kind of on our internal teams and then having those teams really build it into their marketing. And I think just to to answer your question too, like it's up to the PR person who's managing the comms for the whole game to decide the right timing. So when they're on board and kind of have the same goals as us, they can align it like, okay, yeah, we want to do this one at announce. We want to do this closer to launch. So that's, again, just a close partnership we have with those um, other comms colleagues. I love that. Um, and so I do, I do want to be able to mention this because like as of we're recording this, um, Ubisoft Forward is, is, is coming up. Um, so how much is your team involved in including accessibility? Because for context, for those listening, like Ubisoft Forwards have been kind of, again, leading the way of, as, as far as uh, make, like making sure that that event uh, or showcase is extremely accessible to as many people as possible. They were the ones who sort of spearheaded a lot of uh, subtitles of multiple languages, audio descriptions uh, for their trailers, if, if if there are like if if they're able to get some, and and also even the uh, like the showcase themselves are generally been you know consistently uh, accessible from uh, like for the past couple of years now to the point where it's like now other studios are trying are catching up to what Ubisoft has been able to do. So how much involvement do you have with uh, a, like planning an event like that to be able to uh, make it uh, accessible, but then also, you know, letting folks know, Hey, you can also be able to like watch this at, or, or view this or listen to this in, in any format that's accessible or more comfortable to, uh, to them. So it's a very involved process involving a lot of teams. Um, what I will say is I absolutely love working with the Ubisoft Forward uh, events team. So there's kind of a core team that makes sure the, the show is produced. Um, they're, they're wonderful and they had been considering accessibility, you know, back when we were doing our press conferences at E3. So it was something that was on their radar. And then as we learned more from the communication side and kind of partnering with David more, um, we just had more and more conversations where um, back in 2020, David introduced us like, hey, we thought about doing audio description and we didn't know about it. So we kind of went down the path of learning what it was, um, talking to different brand teams. And we started with the Assassin's Creed Valhalla team. Um, it, and so that was something where the the team working on, on the game, um, at working on the, the marketing trailers, uh, they were super on board. They're like, oh, this is cool. Let's figure it out. So we kind of figured it out for that trailer. And then we were saying, okay, well, how can we do this for the different trailers that are going to be in forward? Turns out we couldn't do it for every trailer that was in forward that year, um, but we were able to in years after. So 2022, we had audio describe the whole show, um, but it was definitely an iterative process of figuring out what needs to be done, who needs to get on board. Um, But I will say we 
we had the kind of interest and we wanted to do it from the beginning in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, it was just figuring out the logistics of, you know, how do we audio describe all these trailers in time and what's that process like? So it's been um, a very iterative process. And so I think you also asked, how do we bring it to life and then how do we share it? And so those mm -hmm. are, um, again, different teams. So we have the production team bringing the show, um, whether it's live and in person or digital or hybrid or both. Um, and we also have social media teams or Ubisoft news teams. So that's actually where my role is kind of the most, um, most important where the events team and the social media team, it's like just bridging that connection for accessibility. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we've audio described a trailer. Well, if we don't tweet about it, how's anyone going to know that we audio described it? So mm -hmm. just making that connection too with and considering all the different deadlines and timelines and we have tons of trailers coming in to help, you know, they all need to be delivered at the same time to produce the show. But then how do we make sure to kind of draw that line between what we produce and how we talk about it? And do we put it in our press release and just all of these different uh, communications aspects and kind of bringing that together. And that's where my skill set as communications person kind of comes in. I love that. Uh, and actually, speaking of, of social media, like uh, we chatted before about the about, uh, about social media and, and accessibility, and like I like uh, with the amount of social teams that Ubisoft has, like it, uh, I can only imagine uh, that it's very much like herding cats. Uh, you're all they're always constantly reacting to uh, everything that's happening on social media, but also you know there's a lot of uh, social media assets and posts that are happening, uh, especially around a uh, an announcement of a game or just or like as we said like around. Ubisoft forward there's just a lot that's being uh put out there um so what are some of the like the the things that you tell uh the social teams or what do you, how do you work with the social teams on trying to be able to um uh make sure that that what they're putting out is accessible and what are some of the uh the the things you tell them okay like, hey, here's how to be able to make the, uh, these assets accessible so one thing we talked about is kind of the importance of listening to the community. Like, I'm not a social media expert. I'm not a accessible social media expert. I've learned a lot over the years, but that's not my area of expertise. So a lot of it is hearing from the community, oh, hey, this image didn't have alt text. You made some announcement about how many players are part of the game or your post-launch roadmap, and like, I don't know what it says. So we kind of see that, raise it to the right team. We figure out, you know, okay, well, how do we establish a better process for including alt text on images. Do we need to do it on every asset? Do we do it on some assets? If we can't do everything, you know, any asset where we just have words on, uh, just on an image, uh, where all of that the famous thing that developers love to be able to do, they do the, the, the notes uh, of like just text on it on a color image. Uh, text on a color. They love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so when you have the text on a collar, how do you make sure that that has alt text every time? And if you don't put it out originally, put it in a comment afterwards. So in a reply, um, again, not a social media expert. I still call it Twitter. as You heard. So you know what? You're, uh, don't worry about it. I still call it Twitter for more. Like I just refuse to call it X. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But a lot of it's just about letting um, like as a leader in accessibility communications, my role is to help empower others to be experts in their own field of expertise. So I work in communications. I do a lot of connecting dots. I do a lot of pull the information together. You know, who are the, the people we're getting this from? Where are we putting it out? Um, but yeah, I'm not a social media expert. I'm not an expert on marketing trailers. I can just provide that guidance and direction. Um, but ultimately, it really takes those teams and people getting on board um, for us to be able to kind of successfully have an accessible social media strategy. I, that's I, I do like that a lot because it made me think about uh, essentially it's like you're you're not only giving them best practices on here's what like what to do and, and policies and procedures and stuff like that, but you're also helping to develop the culture of of accessibility as well, um, and you know and having people think about accessibility instead of just you know here's here's the accessibility you need to do and then it's a checklist that they have to sort of check off that you know that the here's like okay we i got the alt text done that kind of thing it's it's your you're like having your help helping people actively think about it uh in a way that it will just benefit the the users uh in of itself like 
yes, it takes like even just for myself, like it, adding alt text to an image. I've gotten into a habit of doing it every single time, but it is that habit that has to be kind of built over time. So when you're talking to, to, to teams, whether it's social or just, you know, in the communications team about building that uh, sort of culture that they're thinking about accessibility, what are some of the things that, you, that you're telling them um, as well as the best practices? So we often start with kind of the checklist of, you know, hey, I saw this image, it didn't have alt text, here's why we need it, and here's how to write alt text. And we actually, our social team put together a best practices document. And so they have this resource, um, I send them the link and I say, hey, I noticed this wasn't here, here's the link. Um, but I think, you know, how does it go beyond the checklist? It really is about those individuals, like understanding the vision and being mm -hmm. passionate about understanding and like serving this community. So that's something where um, you can't be a one person show when it comes to being an accessibility advocate at your company because you will burn out quickly and mm -hmm. you'll feel really bad when things don't get done that aren't your responsibility. Um, and I think that's important. I think it's really important. Like I can't do everything and I shouldn't, and I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, all I can do is share best practices with other people and it's up to them to kind of see and understand the vision and take it further than the checklist. Um, but I can share the checklist. So that's kind of the extent of like, I can share the checklist, I can share the vision, I can share the needs from the community. Um, but the way we've actually gotten so many things done is because the people I'm talking to get it and then they take it and they implement it on their team. So. I love it takes that. A village. <laughs> it definitely does, a hundred percent. It's it, it, and I agree with you. It's like yeah, being able to do it on your own, it's hard. Uh, and uh, you should like you recruit people to help you because then that'll that'll help uh, uh, sort of alleviate some of that uh, that burnout for sure. Um, but you know, kind of expanding even beyond that. So we kind of talked about sort of what Ubisoft is is doing when it comes to marketing and, and, and PR for accessibility. Uh, I want to kind of uh, get your thoughts on and what would you sort of suggest to other teams um, that are, are looking into, they want, you know, they want to uh, market accessibility and, and do it properly. Um, what are some advice that you would give uh, those teams uh, as far as best practices? So one approach that's worked really well for us is starting with a small win. Um, so kind of have a case study. So if there's something you want to do, and I guess I'll go back to the audio description in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So that was a big brand. It was a big, um, it was their cinematic reveal trailer. Mm -hmm. um, and so once we had done audio description for that asset, it was something that every other team like, okay, we want to do audio description. Here's the example of how the Assassin's Creed Valhalla team did that. And here's the asset. So you can take a look at it. It's on YouTube. It's not just an idea we had. It's something that we actually did. It's doable. And here's how. So starting with just one win, like I didn't start with audio describing every single asset at Forward that year because mm -hmm. that was a little bit too big for where we were at at the time. Um, so, yeah, I think starting small and a small win can become a big win and it can kind of set the blueprint for that, you know, additional, like, like I was saying, someone saying, oh, we audio described that. Like, how can I, you know, take that uh, into my area of, of expertise as well? Okay, I, I love that. And so um, obviously, you know, obviously like Ubisoft has been a, a leader in that uh, for, for a long time. Like, but where, uh, where do you see areas that, um, like just within the industry that still need improving or even, you know, within Ubisoft as well, that still need improving after like doing this for a few years in? And what do you want to focus on uh, and, and improving on it for future projects. Consistency. Uh, that's mm. something that, you know, the beginning of our journey, it was about education. It was about what needs to be done. How can we achieve it? Um, consistency is hard. We have that roadmap. We have the case study. Like, hey, we did this great over here. Why can't we do it here? So I think that answering that question of like, why can't we do it here? And how do I anticipate those problems and reach out to that team a little bit earlier? Um, how do I set standards? How do I make sure that they are followed that kind of execution implementation? So that's something I wanna see more at Ubisoft and also in the industry. Um, I did kind of a personal audit of how are other co companies communicating about accessibility and doing audio description. 
um, it's inconsistent. It's hard to find. Um, if something was audio described in the past, it's like really hard to Google and search for it. So I want, um, I want to see that expectation being set that if I'm an audience member attending an event in the gaming space, there will be an audio described version somewhere. There will be American Sign Language if the event's in the U.S. Like just having regularity and something that people can kind of consistently know. I can find the version I need and here's where I can find it. That's great. I like, yeah, I think it's just because it, it, it's all you know, when you start these things, it's like it's all bright and shiny and new and people are excited about it. But it like it's being able to be consistent with that moving forward because it you, you start this thing and it's cool it's great you know you got a lot of fee great feedback from it but it's being able to be consistent because that and you're right it, that is hard it's like okay yeah you got audio description for one trailer but now what do you do how do you do that for now for every trailer um that you do and that's and that's something that uh can be it can be difficult depending like as as games evolve and change over time things you know come at like can, like can come up pretty fast or it, some things you can plan for um but it's having that consistency is, is is super key as well so i like that that's that's a good answer um and kind of actually a bit of a of a, of a tangent it's been something that i've been kind of i personally have been sort of thinking about a, a, a lot a lot lately and because uh, we see we see within uh, the in the gaming space, but also I think just even outside and like it just in talking about accessibility in general, there's a lot of uh, like oftentimes whenever PR marketing um, kind of uh, wants to talk about accessibility, they kind of uh, I, I sort of picture it's like it's like a rainbow in the sky that just says inspirational across it, <laughs> uh, and it's there's always that you know it's just so inspiring to see disabled people doing basic tasks that everyone else can do uh and it's it, it, so how how do you either necessarily avoid or how do you in, like integrate you know but like uh, proper information or also just uh, like how, how do you sort of avoid that that pitfall of t talking about accessibility in a way that's like not that, that's not just inspirational but it's like there's value to that uh to the the, the disability community I had thought of two ways to answer the question, and one was a little a little sassy. Um, oh, be <laughs> sassy! I love be... being sassy. It's great. <laughs> what would be inspirational is if you consistently did the work. <laughs> oh, that's... I love that. That's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I want to tell tell teams is that you know I'm inspired by consistent implementation <laughs> of processes <laughs> and best practices. Um, but you know, I think a lot of it comes down to dismantling tropes, and that's something. Again, I'm, you know, I'm not disabled, and that's something where we rely on those experts within our accessibility team. So, um, Darren Thompson on our accessibility team has been extremely helpful in sort of um, helping with a lot of guidance, guidance guidelines, um, and just letting us know what is the right tone that we need to take. So, if we see a team that kind of comes up with that. Uh, in overly inspirational, but not like meaningful changes to the accessibility of our game, right? If we don't have meaningful content to share, um, we don't, we talk to them, we don't share it. So <laughs> I, I think that, you know, leaning on the guidance of the experts that, that we have here um, and making sure if something doesn't feel right, that we run it by them. So even though that's not their kind of designated role, that is an area they have, um, expertise in and are able to help guide and shape our decisions and content i love that it's basically like it, it's you know you can talk the talk but you also have to walk it too uh and and it's because then otherwise it could be seen as essentially performative uh and that just even does more harm than the good that you're thinking you, that, that you're doing uh for sure and uh, I like it, it just it because uh, I'll, I'll even say this like I, as we're recording we're literally recording this on Global Accessibility Awareness Day and it's it was something that kind of came up that I was just like there's so many announcements that are happening uh, across the the industry but just across the you know accessibility in general um, that we're seeing and, and it's just like you know some are inspirational but again it's like what I like what what you and the team and uh, and the accessibility team over at Ubisoft have been able to do is that it's that providing that consistency so that it isn't doesn't seem as performative. It isn't seen as just like inspirational. Sure, you can have those moments. It's like 
you know, I've, I've been in one of those videos too, where it's like, you know, inspirational about like the accessibility happening at Ubisoft, but um, it's being able to back that up with like, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're, we're showcasing and allowing that as being part of the announcements and, and, you know, launches of all, uh, of all these games uh, and highlighting a lot of the accessibility that's there uh, is something that uh, I've constantly praised Ubisoft for. And I, and, and I just personally want to be able to thank you and the team at Ubisoft for, for consistently doing that uh, for, for the past several years. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, uh, what more can, uh, could come from that. So, um, so thank you, uh, Jessica, for, for, for doing that. And, and that means a lot. <laughs> Well, thank you for the feedback you've shared with us over the years. And I've always appreciated, you know, some of your feedback we took from uh, tweets and, and YouTube videos that people have shared. And then some of it is you directly pinging us and saying, hey, this tweet doesn't have alt text, can't read it. Um, and so sharing that feedback, and, and I think one thing that is important to share with the community is that we don't only want your positive feedback. We want to know when we're messing up, when something isn't accessible. Um, and, and that's really helpful. Like when we see you call us out in a, in a you know, don't be mean, just tell us what you need. Um, it, it's really helpful to go back and say, hey, like someone was hoping for this trailer to be audio described and it wasn't. And so that helps us say like, there's people waiting on this content. So I, it's helpful, you know, letting us know when we do well and when we have areas to improve. I love that. Um, okay, well, last question I have for you, uh, uh, Jess, is that what are some resources that um, like, players or developers uh, can visit to find out more about uh, the cool accessibility stuff that's uh, being done at Ubisoft or something that, you know, would recommend as resources to learn more uh, about uh, how to build to uh, market uh, accessibility. So for Ubisoft, we, all of our accessibility uh, information lives on news.ubisoft.com. So we have a dedicated accessibility dropdown you can go to and that will have all the spotlights it will have our meet the team. Um, you get to learn more about our accessibility team. So all of our written content kind of has a home. Um, and in terms of other resources kind of outside of Ubisoft, I've learned absolutely so much from the GA Conf um, organizers from attending those events. Um, you know, I think they're they're a wealth of knowledge and, and worth following. And as a as a as addition to that, definitely go check out Jessica's talk uh, at GA conference talking about this exact topic. If you want to be able to learn more, it's a great talk. Make sure to go check it out. There's the videos up on YouTube. You can be able to search for it. Um, so uh, yeah, well, um, thank you again, Jessica, for for being here. I really appreciate it. If people want to be able to uh, follow you uh, on uh, online and and you know get to catch up or be able to know more about what it is that you're doing, uh, where can people be able to uh, follow you? Um, formerly Twitter, now X. Um, it's my first name, last name. So Jessica Roach, there's an E on the end. Perfect. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for, for watching and for listening. If you have any questions, uh, you can contact either myself, Jessica, or the folks at Player Research if you would like to learn more about what we talked about today. And also check out the rest of the series on advancing accessibility. Thanks again and have a great day and go play some games. Take care, everybody.